I'm Jed Dannenbaum, I'm a professor in the uh, production division of the School of Cinematic Arts and the organizer and host for tonight's event. And uh, before we start, I want to thank the staffs of the Visions and Voices uh, office and the School of Cinematic Arts for all the help and support that they've given us, uh, and, uh, and the many others who have been with their generous assistance and advice uh, instrumental in making this evening uh, and today's auxiliary events happen. Uh, and I particularly want to thank the event's superb student coordinator, Violetta Abdi Mukad, who just ran out the door, who has been so gracious and resourceful and tireless in her efforts. Solomon's wise decision making, Nero fiddling while Rome burned, Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat cake. Arthur drawing the sword from the stone. Lincoln born in a log cabin. Obama born in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> Nixon's Watergate cover up. Uh, and Bill Clinton lying about Monica Lewinsky. Those are just a smattering of the many hundreds of political stories uh, that nearly everyone raised in Western culture is familiar with, whether they're fictional, apocryphal, or true. We're here tonight to explore stories and politics, specifically with regard to the upcoming elections, but the larger context of the evening is the power of stories in our lives. We've long understood that stories are somehow essential to who we are and how we see ourselves, and that awareness has been part of the craft of creative artists, historians, journalists, uh, uh, politicians uh, for hundreds of years, uh, even thousands of years in some cases. And recently, brain science has added a new dimension to this awareness uh, through brain imaging technology and many other, uh, other advances. Uh, it's meant that the way that our minds work uh, can, uh, in some sense, for the first time, be measured and tested and understood at a, at a deeper level than ever before. And these scientific advances have been seeping into the humanities, the arts, the professions. And, and, and one result of that is that now in, in practically every academic field and every professional career, story is a subject that is taken seriously, studied, and discussed. Why are stories, fiction and nonfiction, so central to human society? I'm going to suggest that just a few ideas to keep in keep in mind during tonight's uh, discussion. First, stories make sense of the world. They take events that are chaotic, random, deeply complex, uh, too powerful to control, and extract something uh, coherent, something we can understand with a clear cause and effect, perhaps for the, a hero to cheer for and a villain to blame. Uh, or a way to triumph or to achieve justice and resolution. Whether you're a hunter-gatherer tens of thousands of years ago, uh, facing a crippling drought that has made your food supplies scarce, or you live in a modern society and the economy has collapsed and you've lost your job and your home, it's human nature to want to understand what's happened and why, and stories do that for us. I tell my cinema students that the difference between stories and real life is that stories have to make sense. <laughs> Second, stories can bond us together and define who we are as a group. Some of the earliest stories were probably just tales told around a campfire or gossip about tribal elders, but they evolved into elaborate communal participatory rituals with body markings and costumes, symbolic imagery and music, and reference to the group's myths, revered ancestors and commonly held values. In other words, just like a political convention. Third, stories elicit our emotions. They cause us to identify with the protagonist, to take their side and root for them. And in doing so, we adopt their point of view a perspective that the storyteller can use to win us over. The goal might be to get us to quit smoking, 
or to empathize with others and see our commonalities, or to challenge conventional thought, inspire us, and open new vistas. Or the goal might be to get us to buy a certain product, or to accept the status quo, or even to fear and hate people who are different from us. Gandhi used stories, and so did Hitler. Tonight, we'll focus on stories that are not only meant to cause us to vote for a particular party or candidate, or against a party or candidate, but at a deeper level are about how we see ourselves, how we should behave toward each other, and what we stand for and believe as a nation. Our moderator tonight is Marty Kaplan, the Norman Lear Professor of Entertainment, Media, and Society at USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Marty is a true polymath. He graduated from Harvard Summa Cum Laude in Molecular Biology and was also president of the Harvard Lampoon. He received a master's degree in English from Cambridge University in England and a PhD in Modern Thought and Literature from Stanford University. And he served as chief speechwriter to Vice President Walter Mondale and worked at Disney Studios for 12 years as vice president of production for live action feature films and as a writer producer. His credits include the political comedy The Distinguished Gentleman, starring Eddie Murphy, which he wrote and executive produced. Marty was the associate dean of the Annenberg School for 10 years, and is the founding director of the school's Norman Lear Center, whose mission it is to study and shape the impact of media and entertainment on society. We're obviously very fortunate to have Marty to, as tonight's moderator, but he's been much more than that. From the earliest conceptions of this event, He's been an enormously generous advisor and collaborator. Thank you so much, Marty. And now if the entire panel will come to the stage, Marty will introduce our eminent guest. Um, so we've got a, a, a really juicy topic tonight. We've got a great group to talk about it. Uh, the election, as uh, you have all had uh, drilled into your heads, is now 40 days away. So let me just uh, start, we like polls. How many people here are registered to vote? Please a quick show of hands. Excellent, thank you. Um, how many of you will vote? Thank you. And how many of you have decided who you're going to vote for? Okay, thank you. Um, so how stories shape that decision? Stories about candidates, country, and culture, how stories shape it consciously and unconsciously, how stories shape that decision through words and images and through neurons. That's what we're going to be talking about. Um, Homo sapiens is the name of our species. From time to time, people have come up with other names for it. Homo faber, the, the creature that makes things. Homo ludens, the creature that plays. Homo narrans, the creature that narrates, that tells stories. That's, that's our focus this evening. And we have a perfect panel to explore that. We have an actual storyteller who is from the cinematic and literary arts. We have another kind of storyteller, a historian. And we have a scientist who studies stories and, and narratives. So I'm going to introduce them. Please hold your applause until the end, and then we'll welcome them all together. So our storyteller, John Romano, is, has been a writer-producer for television and movies since 1985. He's worked on more than a dozen TV series, including Hill Street Blues, L.A. Law, Party of Five, Providence, and Monk. Among his screenplays are The Third Miracle, Intolerable Cruelty, The Lincoln Lawyer, and, and now in pre-production and adaptation of Philip Roth's novel, American Pastoral. And as a bonus, he has a PhD in English literature from Yale, and he was an assistant professor of English at Columbia. Our historian, Joyce Appleby, is a professor emerita of history at UCLA. If you're a historian, there are two key organizations in this country, the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians. And Joyce was president of both of them. Her books, uh, she's a specialist in the political thought 
of the Early American Republic. Uh, her books include Inheriting the Revolution, The First Generation of Americans, and The Relentless Revolution, A History of Capitalism. She's also the co-author of a book about historiography, which I find particularly intriguing, Telling the Truth About History. So maybe, maybe that'll be part of what we'll be talking about, what do historians do. Now, to introduce our third guest, I'd like to steal something from him and ask to try to conduct an experiment. Would you all please not think of an elephant? Okay, you got that? All right, well then, you probably, based on what you just did, know why uh, don't think of an elephant, know your values, and frame your debate by Professor George Lakoff became a New York Times bestseller. He is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor of Cognitive Science and Linguistics at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. His books, his other books include uh, The Political Mind, which is, uh, I highly recommend, I recommend all his books, The Political Mind, A Cognitive Scientist Guide to Your Brain and Its Politics, and his latest book, The Little Blue Book, The Essential Guide to Thinking and Talking Democratic. Please welcome our panelists. Perfect time, thank you. So I want to start by quoting something uh, from uh, the political mind, and then asking you all to contribute to the uh, to comment on it. Okay. So here here's uh, the passage. Politics is very much about cultural narratives. For candidates, it's about the stories they have lived and are living, the stories they tell about themselves the stories the opposition tries to pin on them, and the stories the press tell about them. But in a deeper sense, politics is about the narratives our culture and our circumstances make available to all of us to live. Uh, Drew Weston, someone I know we both admire, says that every campaign is really four stories. There are the positive stories the candidates tell about themselves, and the negative stories they tell about each other. So I'd like us all first to try to construct and, and, and put on the table what those four stories are. What is, for example, Obama's story about Obama? Um, uh, let's see how I can answer that in a way that will reflect something in my own experience as a citizen. Um, there, is, there, there is an undeniable log, log cabin element in the Obama story. I think it mattered a great deal in 2008. I'm not sure it matters very much now. Um, it has, uh, inevitably, it would be very hard uh, to run without calling attention uh, to the, uh, and, and he certainly did call attention to, the glorious myth he was enacting uh, of a, a childhood, again, where the odds were stacked in, in too many obvious ways for you to hear from me. Uh, rising through um, our most important and established institutions, I'm thinking of Harvard, you say it's um, uh, to, to the position he's in. It, 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 it was there for the taking. It would have been very hard not to uh, to tell that story. What I cherish in <clears throat> my own attachment to, to the Obama, um, to Obama as a phenomenon as a, and as a leader, is how complex it is. I love the fact that he's not that he's only black among other things that he is. I love the fact that he is only, um, that, that he is uh, only sort of from the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, you know, there's something, I, I, I like what a mess his story is. Well, let's let leave it at that for a moment. And Joyce, would you like to add to what the story Obama is telling? Well, I thought I would say what um, um, Mommy was making of that. I'm gonna ask you to wait. <laughs> Mommy was making of that. Uh, did you wanna add anything to the Obama story? It was like it's a dinner too. <laughs> well, look, um, there are basic narratives that then get applied to politics. Oops, sorry, there are basic narratives that get applied to politics. The rags to riches nar narrative is there all over the place. We'll talk about, uh, oddly enough, a Romney version of this. But uh, Obama had uh, a version of the rags to riches story. And moreover, the other major story that you have in politics is a hero story. That is, there's a villain who is doing bad things 
to people, and uh, the hero is going to come in and beat the villain and uh, save the victim uh, and, um, you know, be cheered and uh, get a reward. I mean, that is, uh, those stories were there, both there. And uh, in the Obama story, there was also something very primitive about his understanding of America uh, in his story about his mother. Uh, when he was asked, uh, what is the most important thing uh, your mother taught you in the morning TV? Uh, he said, empathy, to put yourself in someone else's shoes. When he was asked, what is patriotism? Uh, he was asked by um, CNN 360. He said, it um, begins with caring about other citizens. Uh, that is, he, he made empathy, if you start looking up uh, his use of empathy in that campaign, central to the campaign. And he pointed out in his uh, remarkable Father's Day speech in 2008, which is probably his greatest speech, but never reported. Uh, what he pointed out there is that uh, to be, uh, you know, a real parent is to uh, be uh, empathetic to your spouse and your children, to teach them to be empathetic to other people, to be responsible for yourself and for them, to teach your children to be responsible, because if you don't do that, we'll have a generation of people who don't care about anybody else. And then he said government should be the same way. And this is what gives rise to the idea of the public. That is, the public provides things for everybody because we care about each other and we provide the, all those schools and bridges and roads and uh, you know, research and all the things that, that uh, have been discussed recently, uh, especially by Elizabeth Warren. And that, that is a major part of the Obama story. Can we hold it just there for a second? I would add uh, just one other story. There are many. These are a couple of strands. Uh, Obama as a uniter, that there is not a red state and a blue state. There is the United States of America. And his story uh, that he was selling was, I will be the person who knows that and make it so. So now I'm going to turn to uh, Romney and ask Joyce, uh, what is Romney's story? Oh, well, I think Romney. Um obviously is trying to t tell the same story. He's even trying to be a rash riches, which is a little hard when you hear about the tuna casseroles they had when they were graduate students in just one week. Um, <laughs> so Romney is trying to do the same thing. It just isn't that effective because it isn't really his story, the story that he is trying to tell about himself. Um, and I think that this is, as you'll see, that it's, um, it seems critical that the story you tell about yourself has a there's similitude to it that, that, that is convincing. And I think that this is one of the things that's been striking in this campaign is that there hasn't been this equality of personal conviction about the story that the candidates are telling. John, you want to contribute to the Romney message? Uh, it, 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 what's the saying, in a way, is that Romney doesn't own a really quite decent story, which is it is possible to be born uh, on the right side of the tracks and still have empathy and still conceive of yourself as a member of the community. You don't have to prove that you were poor for us to believe that you care about other people. I know some downright nasty poor people. And I don't see why Romney should, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me just bad strategy and we see right through it as the way it suggests when, you know, he really claims the regs uh, to riches one. George, you want to add a piece? There are a couple of things that, are, that need to be added. First, if you watch the RNC convention, uh, what you got was lots of rags to riches stories, not about mostly about the people there, but about their fathers and grandfathers, and and so you have the idea that oh my my uh, father or grandfather was a rags to riches story, and I have the same grit he does. I inherited it, right? And uh, <laughs> and, and that was the story was over and over. We, you know, the inheritance of the rags to riches story. And, and it doesn't play that well. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a deeper story here. Um, the uh, kind of family uh, model that this is based on is what is called the strict father model, where you have a father who has full authority in the family, whose job is to uh, protect the family, um, support the family, and uh, run the family. 
and say what's right and wrong and have everybody do what they, as follows. And the children are assumed to be uh, not born good, but to be born to just do what they feel like doing. You've heard about feel good liberals. These are the you know the, 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 the children there, and they have to be trained uh, to do what the father says, uh, what is what is right. So they have to be punished uh, painfully enough so they avoid that and they get disciplined. And if they get disciplined, they can then work hard, go out in the world, become prosperous. Now, what if they're not prosperous? Well, they didn't have the right discipline, so they can't be moral, so they deserve their poverty. And this is, that story is projected onto the market, where the market is the decider. The market, there's nobody, uh, nothing above the market. It is natural, it is moral, and what would be above the market? Government, regulation, taxation, unions, and court cases, all the things conservatives don't want. Similarly, uh, the idea there is that uh, all of conservatism is based on this moral system. And this is what you get in Romney's uh, story. So when you hear about Romney, he is saying, look, this is all about individual responsibility. What is democracy? It's a totally different view than Obama's. Uh, it is a, something that says democracy gives you the liberty to pursue your own self-interest and your own well-being without worrying about uh, or any, having any responsibility for the well-being or self-interest of others and without anybody helping you. That you, therefore, have the respect of doing it yourself, you've achieved it yourself, you deserve that respect, and that is because you're moral. You have moral strength, you've done that, and the people who haven't, you know, don't have that moral strength. And I know that we have a, 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 a visual aid to talk about that. Before we do, what I'd like to do is uh, to add the other two stories, the, the negative stories. So, so uh, John and Joyce, maybe you want to take these. What does, what does Obama say is the Romney story? Well, you know, here's one thing that's going to make this, conver these conversa this conversation interesting slash difficult. Um, which is, is this, we're going to have a hard time distinguishing between what we think to be the case and what we're going to describe as the story foisted upon the other guy. So I don't know where I'm landing when I say this. I think that, Ob that, that I'm very happy to see that the Obama campaign successfully articulate a very particular charge, which is this kind of out of touchness, the failure to imagine what most people's lives are. For me, it was not, not much of made it, but the most graphic. Sort of molecule that uh, was put the force in the Republican convention, uh, Democratic convention, was the young man Castro, the mayor of, of uh, San Antonio, was mm -hmm. in, who told the story about how uh, Romney, I think in a very well intentioned way, I by no means shared George Lucas' idea that conservatives are not moral because their fathers are not strong. But, 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 uh, but this is Romney being moral. He is telling, he is telling uh, uh, an audience of, high, of underprivileged high school students, mostly Latina. Uh, that they should, you know, if they don't know to feed, go and start their own business. Well, where do we get the money for this? Well, from your dad. You know, your family will loan you the money to start a business. This showed such <laughs> a stoop, I mean, the only word for it, such an ignorant view of what the lives of the people that he was looking at, and let's say for the sake of argument, whom he cared about, with whom he empathized, that showed an ignorance of the facts of their lives. I don't need to think. However, whether his father was weak or strong, I don't need to think he didn't care about those people. The more interesting and damaging truth is that he really did, but had no idea in the world what their lives were like and where they might go from here. So that is now the, the, that is the kind of story the Obama campaign is doing a really good job of getting out there. Obama as uh, Romney as a person who doesn't know, who hasn't lived your life, and therefore really can't address your needs, however well-intentioned, something I'm prepared to give conservatives. I believe, by the way, while well, George is put on the table, there is a rich, enduring tradition of conservative empathy. I believe David Brooks wrote brilliantly the other day about the lost tradition of conservative community, uh, of caring about others, which belong to a conservative view of I mean, Listen, I'll take the loyalty of them. Never voted Republican, I'm a liberal Democrat. But I do not need to think of them uh, as, as in this morally hobbled in, in the way you're saying. But that is a story to tell about Romney, which is true and tell I'm going to ask you to hold off to respond to that. This is what John Romano is like when he doesn't know where he's going to land. Yeah. <laughs> John, 
Joyce, do you want to comment on the Romney message uh, about Obama? Yes, I would, because what I think is fascinating is that it's such an appealing story that Obama has. The hero, rags to riches, the empathy, the uniter, that they have to totally delegitimize the man. They can't say, I'm against the story, I have certain values. No, he was born in Kenya. He's not a citizen. We don't know have his birth certificate. No, he's not a Christian. He says he's a Christian. He's not. He's a Muslim. I don't think in American politics I have ever witnessed the time in which a candidate's very identity is what it's being is being just impugned at every point. Now that tells me that this is a story that is so appealing they don't have a reasonable way to respond to it, to replace it with something that's credible. But they replace it with something that's politically and socially incredible. Can we roll the clip and then you'll pick up on the other side? Let me finish one thing because I don't want to respond to Tom because I didn't get a chance to really say the whole thing. Uh, one of the interesting things about the brain, uh, since you uh, presumably all think with your brains and uh, all thought is physical and works with neural circuitry, is that you can have uh, two opposite views of morality in your brain. So you have conservative morality, which is really moral. As my, I've argued that conservatives really believe in what they're doing because they're moral. And they have a moral view that's different from progressive morality. But many people are conservative in some ways and progressive in others. And what that means is they have both moral systems in their brain, but they're about different things. And how is this possible? Because brains have structures called mutual inhibition, where the activation of one turns off the other and you don't even notice the difference. In case you want a non-political example, just think of morality on Saturday night and Sunday morning. <laughs> now, that, you know, it's real. That's how brains work. And the people you were talking about in terms of the old-fashioned conservatives were partly progressive in all kinds of ways. That is, there are people who, uh, you know, who cared about having a, a vibrant inner city, who cared about having a, a clean, clean drinking water, uh, and things of that sort. You know, Nixon, uh, you know, uh, did a lot of uh, urban renewal, he did uh, issues having to do with, uh, he started the EPA, he did all sorts of things uh, that were, in fact, progressive. And, uh, by the way, as, a, as an MIT freshman, I interviewed the Kennedy and Nixon um, uh, advisors on um, uh, urban affairs, at, who were both at MIT, and I said, what would be the difference between you? And they said, both said there would be none. We agree entirely. <laughs> because they were both progressive on those issues. I know, John, you, you have, okay. Uh, so uh, I just want to, great, okay. So um, I just want to add to these four stories, a couple of components. Uh, Romney, uh, his positive story is that he is a, he's a businessman, only a businessman can get the economy working. That, that's part of his narrative. Obama's narrative about Romney for a while included, he's a flip-flopper. And then they decided that wasn't the best narrative, that instead he's an extremist. Uh, the, the narrative about Bain and vulture capitalism, picking up from Newt Gingrich, uh, uh, that Romney shoots from the hip, that he's the old ways, it's going back. And Romney on Obama, uh, he's the nice guy who doesn't have a clue. Uh, he apologizes for America, and uh, he's the other, as you all said, and he's also uh, the champion of the moochers, which I would like to use as a, uh, a, a cue to roll the, the clip uh, about uh, Romney, if you could, please. Three years. Uh, everybody's been told this. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. How are we going to do it? Entitled, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. 
Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, 
It can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like the, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative election... ...candidates have taken dirty to a whole new... It can level. seem like a return to civility is not possible. is that he's trying to reassure you to say, don't worry about the nastiness and the mudslinging now. We've always been doing it. And it's wrong. It's a wrong story. And I think what's huh. really important about the election of 1800 is that it, it shows a collective discovery of what democracy is all about. Because 1800, they had such different ideas, they were totally unprepared for a campaign in opposition. Founding fathers did not have any belief or knowledge of parties. They knew about factions over a particular matter, but they had no sense of a group coalescing around principles and then voting consistently on the basis of those principles. So they had clueless about that. They also didn't think there were going to be contested presidential elections. It was going to be a succession. George Washington, followed by John Adams, followed by Thomas Jefferson, all in an orderly way. They didn't think that contested elections were really congruent with Republican government. Most of their struggles had been with all policies of the crown. So they thought once they got rid of the crown, they weren't going to have this problem. But what's really fascinating is they had no conception of an issue. Now, an issue is something that honorable men and women can differ on. They understand that. But if you don't have a conception of an issue, when someone disagrees with you, they're impugning your honor. One of the fascinating things about the uh, early years of the democracy was how many political duels there were. Why were there political duels? Because people opposed another candidate, but it wasn't around the parlor uh, piano. It was in the newspapers, because you have a democracy that's pushing news. So men were humiliated to have be publicly exposed or excoriated for a particular position, and often ended up in, in duels. And then the other thing is that they had no idea that there were flaws in the Constitution. The Jeffersonian went into opposition, breaking with his tradition of waiting his turn for after eight years of Adams, because he thought the Federalists were just turning America into Great Britain Jr. And it was too important that he couldn't wait to have you in the opposition. And they had such discipline that all of Jeffersonian electors voted saying for the two men who were going to be president and vice president. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. The problem is, there wasn't a vice presidential slot. The runner-up got to be vice president, but there wasn't any runner-up. What happened when you have a tie? It's thrown into Congress. It was even the old Congress that was the Federalist Congress, and they go through 35 ballots before Thomas Jefferson wins. Why? Because the Federalists say, hey, now we can get Aaron Burr. This will be marvelous. We can have real havoc. And Alexander Hamilton refused to play along because he said, really suspected the integrity of Aaron Burr, where he was only opposed Thomas Jefferson and his womanly attachment to the country revolution. <laughs> so really in this 1800 election, what you see is a group of gentlemen who fought the revolution, instituted the Constitution, opened it up to a much broader electorate of young men, and, and they're just astounded. And what has happened, and they're discovering what democracy entails. And I don't 
think they much like it. Thank you. And George, in a moment, I want to focus on your work on the brain. But I want to bring in one other. Uh, you can break in any time you want. Let her rip. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I just want to bring in uh, uh, another set of stories. So Joyce was talking about the American story. Uh, popular culture uh, has uh, been a place where we have located. Stories. Well, well that, that, it's interesting you say that because one of the things I was listening when Jed was describing what stories for, life is messy, story simplifies it. Let me speak up for another function of story. Sometimes story is there so that we can explore um, what we're not so sure about and we don't know where we end up. The, the, the philosophers use the term aporia to talk about the di those specific dialogues of Plato which, in which you don't end up with a definition of justice, say, or something. What, is the, what, what good is the dialogue then? Well, we air how difficult and confusing the topic is. There's a story in Herodotus that is, um, my contribution to the clip, as I'll tell you, a story from Herodotus, which is used by critics, in fact, two great Marxian critics, Walter Benjamin and George Lukash, have called attention to it. This Here's a screenwriter, very quoting, quoting Benjamin, Benjamin and Lukash. <laughs> not, not common. <laughs> well, here, okay. <laughs> Remarkable, kind of remarkable, what do you think of that? Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, man. Um, here's the story, A king is defeated. He watches um, his children led forth in slavery. He watches his wife taken as the concubine of the conquering prince. He sees all the treasures of his house and stress over him, but through all of this, he is impassive. He sees an old servant led out in chains, and he breaks down and starts to weep. Now, what Lukash and Benjamin both said in different ways was, we don't know what the story means. The story is really terrific because we do not know its bearings. We cannot, now, everybody's saying, oh, I know what it means. But that's the point. You would not necessarily give the person next to you. So in that case, that's what story for. Sometimes story does not simplify a chaotic world. It gives us a place to talk about how confusing it is, how clear we ain't on this issue. Uh, the, the most important literary example is probably Anna Karenina, which is also the best novel ever written, right? And. Um, <laughs> and Thank you. In honest case, uh, Tolstoy thought that women who were adulterers were, were evil. He himself had a raging sexual practice, but he, was, he thought in women it was sort of unseemly. And he wrote a novel, he set out to write a novel several times in his life about an adulteress. When he finally did, in full form, uh, at the top of his powers, as he wrote the story of Anna Karenina, who sleeps with someone other than her husband, I don't believe Kira Knightley can pull this off, let's hope. But, um, not quite right, right? But anyway, as he wrote the story, he fell in love with Anna, not the character, but the project. That is, his sympathy and his empathy were called on in contradiction to his opinions. His opinions didn't change, but the dramatization of her dilemma, of her subjectivity, um, and her consciousness, Held their held sway against his own opinions. If this this would not be the greatest novel ever written, if it were an allegorization of his opinion about sex or women. Instead, it's Tolstoy calling his own ideas into question because the story is just that good a story. So when you talk about story as answering questions, reducing complexity, sometimes our story is a way of talking about how complex a thing desire family really is not a way of saying, and here's the through line. And Obama's a great example of this for me, because as I said, what's attractive to him, uh, to me about him is what a mess that story is. Do you want to show the clip first and then pick up on the other side oh, of that uh, point? Uh, uh, yes, well, okay. That's the great, so uh, could you show the clip? It's from the movie The Man Who Shot Liberty Bell. Well, you know the rest of it. I went to Washington, we won statehood, I became the first governor. Three terms as governor, two terms in the Senate, ambassador to the court of St. James, back again to the Senate, and a man who, with a snap of his fingers, could be the next vice president of the United States. Well, you're not going to use the story, Mr. Scott? No, sir. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> John, you want to... It's very simple. He was not the man who shot Liberty Valance. It, 
the story he had just told, you see that it was John Wayne, who else? Um, <clears throat> we got Liberty Bounds. And he's setting the record straight. Nobody wants the record set straight. Uh, we're attached to our stories. But there's such a thing as a hero. In my version, a hero is someone who doesn't need a story. He's not the, he, he's not the protagonist of a story. He steps up, he goes above and beyond story in ways that we cannot predict by knowing what race he is, what party he belongs to, what his opinion about rent control. He, he, he'll surpri- he or she will surprise you by the variety and unpredictableness of this much messier thing called the truth. But he will always be met in the press by the journalist who says, no, I got a good story here. The man who shot Liberty Bounds and tears up the more complicated truth. The truth is always a little boring. That's my that's my contribution. The truth is always a little boring, and we don't we don't like that. We tell a better story than the truth. So there are a lot of people here tonight because they are fans of George Lakoff's work, and I wanted to be sure we had a good chunk of attention uh, uh, to focus on it. If we could spend the whole evening, alas, we don't have it. Let me a- a quote the epigraph you picked for the political mind and ask why you picked it, what it means. It's. It's a quote from uh, my, our colleague Antonio Damasio's book, Descartes' Error. The immune system, the hypothalamus, the ventromedial frontal cortices, and the Bill of Rights have the same root cause. Uh, and by the way, Antonio is here tonight at USC. Oh, yes. Uh, he is our he's, colleague. He's here? Yes. Colleague. He's, he's here. Uh, and he's right. Uh, What's interesting to me about it is that we don't have a choice about whether we have stories. Our brains construct stories. Our brains construct uh, what are called frames, that is, structures with which we understand the world. Uh, Our brains uh, construct narratives, which are those frames over time. Our brains uh, naturally, without any thinking, just living in the world, construct metaphor systems, very elaborate systems of metaphors that take those basic narratives and turn them into other stories. And our brains fit those stories naturally to our experiences uh, in all kinds of ways in which we become part of that story. We become either heroes or victims or uh, we rarely become villains. Uh, although for some people that's okay. And uh, the, the point is that uh, and we uh, have rags to riches stories of our own lives or other kinds of stories in which our, our lives are incidental and it's all an accident, whatever. We have stories for our own lives, for, for other things that naturally arise and that arise you know, because of the way we live and the rest of our lives. And our brains are set up to do that, and we can't avoid it. There's no way not to have stories. I, I, my own view is very different, let me say it briefly, without hyperbole. I believe that the function of consciousness begins precisely where you finish. It is uh, The function of consciousness is to transcend story, to see outside the metaphors. Pache, cognitive science, which I think is a wrong road in itself, there is such a thing as a free mind. Pache, Stanley Fish, there was such a thing as free speech. Pache, the whole bunch, there is a sense in which the function of the mind is to do better than the stories that are that may be chemically, for all I know, offered to it. There is, such, there is life beyond the metaphor. There are ways of thinking that you cannot explain on a corona by knowing the story that that Tolstoy is condemned by his opinions and his culture to tell. Let's leave the marker there if we can. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and look, part of the story that you're telling is a story. I, that's, it's that's a, that's a very trick. important story. That's a trick, George. No, it's not. You're saying it's very, it's, words it's no, it's important. very, very real. Okay. That is, part of the, the story of the rationalist is that the rationalist can transcend metaphor, can transcend story, the can transcend all around things. things that they've done. And they, hmm, that they the done. evidence that they have done so is why Western civilization works the way it does. That's not confined by metaphor and story. No. It the fact is that, that all of those... Time. All of those rationalist stories have other metaphors in them, and they work by different metaphors. And the point is that because of uh, the fact that you can be a bi-conceptual, not only morally, but in terms of your understanding of the world, 
you can have different brain circuits for understanding different things. That is what saves us. That, you know, that mutual inhibition that says you can have different stories for different things, and not only that, you can be a hero by looking for them. That, and, you know, that's what scientists are about. We're, you know, we're, we're, our job is to look for what's, you know, and when, when we have a story and we find out that it's wrong, we have a theory and it doesn't work, our job is to say, okay, what does work? Right? Now, there are other people no, who will, say, who will, will not do that. that. In fact, you can dwell in that space where we know that X doesn't work, but we don't have Y yet. I don't, this is, that would ask coons and soda water. I don't really buy that, that version that we have to replace paradigms with each other. I don't buy the claim that we all have closed belief systems and we just go from one to the next. There's such a thing, it's called a free human being who exists in a space that is not predetermined by Confining metaphors. I think that view is self defining and dehumanizing, but that was No one said predetermination at all. Can we this is not about predetermination. You know, it, the, in anyone who uh, has anything to do with screenwriting knows without conflict, no drama. Okay. So we're doing okay. But uh, Troy, I think that we, I want to get back to the election and the narrative of the election. And one of the fascinating things about the stories we tell about to explain reality is that the story changes with the outcome. Now, if Romney wins, we're going to have a different story about this campaign. It, Which we will reverse Obama. engineer and tell. Right. But, uh, that, that tells you that stories just aren't inventions. They are, it's another way of saying, understanding what you've experienced, telling yourself what you've experienced. And I think that, that this is one of the fascinating things about campaigns, is that they put out so much material, which is conjectural, but it's presented as true. And, and we'll get to see. We'll get to see a lot when we see the debate next week of what these men and their presentation of self. And I think probably all of us are open to having our reality modified because Romney isn't this wooden figure who is unsympathetic to his state, but it's also a pretty nice guy who really does understand what's up. And so I think that. He's wrong about everything. But <laughs> well, I, but it's yes, so, it's, there's going to be, we're going to have, it's going to have an impact. So, Sure, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just a conversation. Well, let me uh, add a quote uh, from President Obama on story. Um, he told uh, Charlie Rose that the lack of narrative has been one of his biggest, administration's biggest missteps. The mistake of my first term, my first couple of years, was thinking that this job was just about getting the policy right, but the nature of this office is also to tell a story to the American people. George, you want to comment on that? Um, well, um, in 2006, I gave him a little book saying that uh, in his hand before he even before he even decided to run. Uh, and I don't know that he read it. I know his speechwriter did. However, uh, he may have gotten it after a while. And I, and I think he has. I mean, he did a great job in 2008 giving a narrative that then became a policy wonk. And what happened, uh, there's, there's a very interesting thing that happened uh, to him with health care that you should know. Uh, before he took office, after he was elected, he uh, had surveys done as to what should go into his health care plan. What were the most popular provisions and no preconditions, etc. And they were all, uh, you know, uh, 60 to 80 percent in favor. People were in favor of it. And the assumption was, by the policy wonk assumption, if you have something that every, where every position, every part of, the, of a plan has you know, 60 to 80 percent in favor, then everybody you know, should be in favor of this plan. The conservatives never attacked any of those provisions. They never said, oh, we should have preconditions. Never heard that. What they did was they went to another part of the brain. They went to the conservative moral system where they said, we're going to have two moral principles, freedom and life as a government takeover and there are death battles. Government takeover, death battle repeated over and over. And what happened was less than 50% of the people who liked these things, 80%, were in favor of the entire plan. And Obama didn't get it. He didn't understand what had happened. And you know, he gave a speech in the summer of 2009 saying, oh, here are you know 20 different provisions of this thing. And the next day, Axelrod went, um, sent out a note uh, you know, to 13 million people on the, on the website saying, hey, um, go to your friends and neighbors and um, 
tell them about the twenty four important things in this plan and just to make them easy to remember here are three groups of eight right you all remember the three groups of eight right no cognitive science there at all no notion of narrative that covered the whole thing the other guys took the narrative and ran with it so Joyce and John could you take examples from other presidencies other campaigns that illustrate storytelling by effective storytelling by a president well I suppose Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the one who told a story that he was lucky in that the depression had lasted so long that it couldn't possibly be blamed on him so he told a story about one's compassion there is an example of a rich man who didn't back away from his richness at all he drew on that aristocratic tradition as it were to suggest that the general welfare was something that was a concern so I think that Roosevelt's rhetoric though it didn't predict the new deal at all it was cautious but it still conveyed that confidence that as he said in his inaugurated all we have is fear is fear itself it was that capacity to project an identity to people's misery but also being out separated from it and capable of addressing it so I would say that was a pretty powerful narrative well that's a complexity of mind I hope we see again in American leadership I mean that's and you know those of us who feel certainly about Obama think that that's true of him as an example I like to use the Kennedy presidency because it shows both the telling of the story by a president to make a point but then his realization that it's just a story and we shouldn't be overboard when Kennedy was introducing a certain new missile program a bomb delivery system the council United Council of Churches and Jews and Christians there's a leadership council of religious leaders who were opposed to it they carried the banner of the anti-military movement in those days and they came to him and they told him they were in the Oval Office and they said look we're united in feeling this is a dangerous escalation of the Cold War military face down and we just wanted you to know about our opposition to it and Kennedy said well let me tell you why I think it's actually a kind of a peacemaker and he gave his story of why this was a this is Arthur's life here anecdote he gave his version of why this weapon was necessary very persuasively if you know anything about Kennedy those words mean something they listened and they understood that this might actually like bring world peace if the story held water and they said well maybe we ought to back off on our opposition until we look and he said oh no 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 don't do that this is much too important an issue for me to go before the public unopposed this is just me being smart and my boys telling me stuff and me running with it I want you coming at me it's just much too important for me to get a clear feel now that I think it represents a kind of almost human level of complexity about ethics and you know we will not see it's like again although Obama has his I like about him Pache speaks to Charlie Rose I like about him that he's not much of a narratist a friend of ours who's not here tonight I thought he might be collected an article from 19 when was Obama when would Obama have been editor of the law review of Harvard there's an article in the LA Times about the new black head of the law review at Harvard the article is about how disappointed African American students and the progressive wing at Harvard were that the new editor of the law review was black but nonetheless didn't clean house and introduce changes of the kind they expected Obama's been there all his life the story predicts you can see it in the face of Jesse Jackson pretending he was excited about the election the who Obama is the story the narrative we would have him have it predicts that he will do a bunch of things that you know we can make a list of you know so that would be our favorite moves and they and in fact he's a guy who thinks this about that this about the other thing it doesn't fit neatly into the story it's what we call human being let me just comment on this when you gave this quote about Obama when he said my first term and he could have said in my presence but he said in my first term if that isn't a piece of arrogance that slipped in rhetorically that's not this is of course the year of big big money in politics and when the Obama pro Obama forces created their first super PAC Paul Begala who I suspect you know is a political insider was asked 
how are the Democrats, who still don't have as much money as the Republicans, how are they going to turn things around? And his answer was ruthless, relentless storytelling. Um, so uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, we would uh, love to expand this conversation to include your questions. It's always one of the great things about Visions and Voices, that people do get a chance not to make speeches, <laughs> but to ask questions. And uh, But before we do, I just want to uh, uh, add one other clip to the mix, uh, which is uh, about, uh, I, I chose it because uh, it both uh, illustrates something uh, going on now, but it's also about uh, the power of myths about Washington. I think, the, to me, uh, the most powerful Washington movie I ever saw was Frank Capra, Robert Riskin, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which was about Jimmy Stewart, whom we saw in the Liberty Balance clip, uh, a naive Boy Scout kind of guy, believed in everything in the American story, gets to Washington, and the scales fall from his eyes as he realizes how corrupt it is. And it's, uh, the story proceeds from there, but it's, and there's a classic filibuster, uh, which we don't have to do anymore. Uh, uh, we just filibuster by ticking off a box on a form, uh, in which uh, his, uh, he's beaten, and, and so we see how far he's fallen. Um, uh, Jed was kind enough to mention a movie that I wrote, uh, The Distinguished Gentleman, uh, and it is the exact opposite of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. It's about a corrupt, small-town con man, a completely uh, uh, irresponsible, immoral, criminal person. And he goes to Washington because that's where the real money is, and it's all legal. So uh, uh, in this scene, uh, he, is, he, he gets elected by a name recognition trick, and in this scene, he is meeting with one of the most powerful lobbyists in Washington who has taken him under his wing to uh, explain to him how the town works. I'd like to do more money for you, but first I've got to get your positions on a few issues. Now, where are you on sugar price supports? Sugar price supports? Hmm? Where should I be, Terry? Shit, it makes no difference to me. If you're for him, I got money for you from my sugar producers in Louisiana and Hawaii. If you're against them, I got money for you from the candy manufacturers. You pick, let's say, four. Yeah, four. Four. How about putting limits on malpractice awards? Well, you tell me. Well, if you're for them. I got money from the doctors and insurance companies. If you're against them, I got money from the trial lawyers. Let's put you down as against. Yeah, you know what? Put me down for against. Yeah. How about pizza? Oh, no, this salad is going to be enough for me. <laughs> Not for lunch, old buddy. For pack money. <laughs> you thought I was serious? I was fucking with you. <laughs> Well, you are, you are. Fucking with you. <laughs> I'll <boom. laughs> Terry, tell me something. With all this money coming in from both sides, how could anything possibly ever get done? It doesn't. That's the genius of the system. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, 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 an to all the panel. Thank you very much. And let's, uh, there's plenty more that everyone has to say about everything. I apologize for uh, uh, stopping trains of thought, but maybe this is a chance for some more of them to roll. Are we going to have a mic passed around? Yes. Uh, I think we have to one on both aisles. There are mics in the aisles? Are there? Oh, you're going to do that. OK. So great. We, no, we, need, we need one of those mics up here. You can share? OK, great. Questions, please. Yes, David. Just, uh, I'm curious, uh, it'd probably be easier if we talked about battles within parties than against, because this is a Democratic party. So Hillary versus Obama would be interesting to see what narrative won, or in the case of the Republicans, it could have been uh, one of the contests in the primary uh, for the Republican Party. I'm interested to see which, which narrative wins and which loses. But secondary, uh, in light of the 47% comment of the private party, how challenging is it for any, anybody running for office to 
to run in a digital world where they can't target their message. They can't pick the narrative to match the audience. They have to go up 20 levels of abstraction because they know everything will be global and they can't control their audience. Who would like to take any piece of that? Well, uh, about Hillary. Um, Hillary came at this um, from the point of view of a, uh, of a woman who was a white in the, in the White House. And she said early on that she had to come across as a strong, because women were seen as weak, and she had to come as, across as a policy wonk, because as a wife she was assumed not to really know about policy. And those were exactly the things that led to her defeat. That is, she actually is a very warm, quite wonderful person, if you know her at all, a thoughtful person, a deep person, uh, and who does have all those, you know, she understands the policies perfectly well. But she tried coming across as something she wasn't, something that was inauthentic. And that doesn't work. People saw that, and it's only when she cried that she started to get popular. People saw what that what the reality was, and and that's I think uh, a very important thing to understand. Um, I some years ago I had the honor of having lunch with Ronald Reagan's chief strategist Richard Worthlin, um, uh, and I had asked him what it was like to be Reagan's chief strategist, and he said that when he first was hired. He did a poll, and he found out that most people did not like Reagan's positions on issues, but wanted to vote for him. And he didn't understand this, because he was thought the opposite. So he did some uh, focus groups and interviews and so on, and he discovered the following. Reagan talked about values, and if he talked about issues, they were to exemplify values. He connected with people. You know, He communicated well and connected with people. And people assumed that he said what he believed, because he you know, was crusty enough to make it look like he said what he believed, and maybe he did. And then, if, some, if, if you, you talk about values, you say what you believe, and you can connect with people, people can trust that you're going to do what you say, whether you agree with them or not. And then they can identify with you. And they ran all of the campaigns and all of the... Um, the uh, uh, you know, uh, debates and so on, on that basis. So if you listen to the Carter-Mondale uh, debates with Reagan, it sounded to liberals like Carter and Mondale won, but they lost, because it wasn't about those issues. It was about those five things. And that is what's sort of crucial, you know, that uh, you need to be able to understand those things. And when you're watching those debates coming up, remember that. Because this isn't just about you know how how well up you are on the on the issues. Uh, just a quick word on your second half of the question about targeting. And it's true that everything is global and universal. Nevertheless, a huge amount of money and very sophisticated software is being deployed in order to segment the audience into micro niches more in a more sophisticated way than has ever been done before. And to, and to micro-target to that niche a particular message. So though it is true that everything gets around everywhere, there is still a, a belief that, that this will resonate. Another question. Tomorrow, okay. Tomorrow I'm interviewing the campaign manager of the Green Party, and I was wondering what narratives uh, the Green Party or other third parties might use to uh, gain traction here in uh, American elections. I always be thought about that because I, I think they, you know, they were very present in 2008 even, and uh, this the you know, word environment has not really come up much. I think one of the things that's gone wrong with the environment the movement is its storytelling. In a sense, they're wedded to an irrelevancy in their storytelling. It seems to me, which is that the environments, the environmentalists have taught have taught themselves to think that you always have to say that pursuing green ends is not at the expense of the economy, that in the long run it's good for the economy. Well, in the long run, we'll all be dead. In, in, at, a, at a time of, an, of in an economic crisis, um, the short run matters, 
And the environmental movement ought, I mean, I feel very strongly pro-environment, and what we ought to say, look, it's going to cost money. So does fighting a necessary war, or an unnecessary one, so do any number of other things. I don't need to pretend that we're going to be, all have some solar panels by the end of the next week. So I think that they have wedded themselves to a, a, a transparently false story, which is that that there are there's that in the long run it's good for the economy too. Yes, but that's not what's on the table. So I think that they're in that sense very poor storytellers. They become poor storytellers. I'll still write my check, but I'm not thrilled. George, as, as you answer, could you include maybe third parties in the larger context? Well, I was going to just comment that I think the experience with Ralph Nader uh, in the 2008 election, is that the date? No. Four? Two? Uh, 2000. 2000. 2000. 2000. Wow. 2000 mm -hmm. election. It kind of um, made people take a second look at third parties that could be there making a principled statement that could throw an election in a way that they really didn't want to see in the election. So I think that is, is a, a problem. And of course, third parties, um, their principal role in, in American political history is that the major parties have adopted those planks of third parties that third parties have represented when they've been successful. But obviously, third parties have never succeeded in, in sort of the dynamics of majority rule. You have to get a majority uh, in order to win. Well, there are some interesting things to say about this. Third parties, um, you know, we learned from 2000, uh, can have a debilitating effect on the left. However, they can play a very important role in general because they can say things that other parties cannot, and particularly about the environment. Uh, I agree that, uh, you know, they shouldn't have the narrative that this isn't going to cost anything. It will. But more than that, there are several other things. One. They use a fear narrative, and that's not going to work because fear always, you know, brings out the strict father idea. You know, it's a very, very bad idea to use the fear narrative. Secondly, they um, use the uh, let's save the polar bears narrative, which is cute and outside there, but it isn't about. Uh, it doesn't really say why, what that's about, because it's not just about the polar bears; it's about everything. Third, they use the notion of the environment as if it's outside of us. Notice the word about environment says it's outside of us. But in fact, it's inside of us. You know, you breathe that air, you drink that water, you eat those pesticides, right? It's in you. It's in your food. It's in your ch children's food. It's in the womb, right? The idea that this is outside of us is just wrong. Now, there is a nice lead you can take, which is Romney's statement uh, at the RNC that he you know, <laughs> doesn't care about the rise of the oceans and so on, uh, which is important. The rise of the oceans matters, certainly all over the place, but that is also outside of us and is real, but it should be inside of us. All of the stuff about climate change, about you know how things are getting hotter, we have fires all over the place, huge fires in the country. We have, uh, you know, burned the Midwest burning up, uh, fires all all over Texas. We have, um, you know, pesticide runoff in the Gulf of Mexico, killing, you know, seafood and, and fish all over the place. I and mean, this is stuff that's important to us because when you're there, if you're in the middle of a fire or a flood, it's going to matter to you, and it matters to millions and millions of people. It is not outside their lives, it's inside their lives. And I think it's important that, that the environmental movement move inside people's lives where it really is. Terrific, thank you. Other questions? Someone with a, yes. When you talk about stories in the political context, is there something that distinguishes those stories from other kinds of stories, or are the elements all the same? In other words, in politics, are there certain components that have to be in that story to be compelling, or is it just any component for a compelling story would be in a political story as well? First, there are actually three levels of stories that haven't been distinguished here and need to be. Uh, we've, we've looked at the stories of the candidates, but there's also a story about that they tell about the American people. And that's really important in this. 
uh, Romney has a story that says that we, you know, that some people who are strong, morally strong, work hard. They're the good Americans. They're the, you know, the successful people. We should celebrate their success. And the other people who, you know, who are dependent on the government, we shouldn't care about. They're the morally weak people, etc. Yeah, and, and so on. That's a, a big story about America. In addition to that, then there's a story about himself. He's the hero who's going to save America from the villain Obama, who is going to be giving people the, you know, and, you know, to, to giving these weak people uh, stuff so they'll vote for him. Right? That's that is the story that him as hero. Then there's a campaign story. And this is a case where uh, that that Reagan idea about what a campaign is. That is a campaign is like a case where you want to present yourself to, to the public in terms of your values, your ability to connect, whether they can trust you, whether you're authentic, and so on. This is a man who doesn't connect, who, you know, uh, who has values that don't fit the country, and so on. At the level of the campaign, he's a disaster. And that's what people are noticing about this. You have stories at all three levels, and they have to fit. And with Romney, they're not fitting. Barnett. But we need a microphone for you, because the pro condition would love to pick up the staff. I just want to ask Professor Appleby the opportunity to connect that with, with our history. Is Romney connecting with the with the gospel gospel of wealth story that has played in American history and American politics before? That those who deserve and those who act righteously will succeed along some kind of religious principle that has been played before us. Is that his story, and, and, and does it really not work somehow? I think that is his story. I think that's a story that he's trying uh, to connect with, but I don't think that's ever been a very successful in, in, in politics, because I think it's not congruent with American political traditions. It's been successful in uh, you know, winning people over in uh, rotary meetings or uh, you know, at, at some convention of people, but I don't think it is successful because it suggests the one person standing out against the whole, it's, it, and it doesn't really speak to the idea that Americans think they're very special. They're special because they have a government that protects their rights. They're special because they're a land of opportunity. Uh, and so we know that many of these things now have a mythic quality, but I still think that a candidate has to connect with this sort of core story about what Americans are. And what's interesting to me is that the founding fathers really didn't define this. This was a generation that was born after the revolution, a generation that didn't have anything to do with colonial America, wasn't essentially elitist or cosmopolitan as the founding fathers were. It was a, a, a an inward, westward looking, away from Europe and European values. And what did Americans extol? They extol what they thought was unique to them. Great art? No. Great music? No. Great war accomplishments? No. They were sturdy, they were hardy, they were innovative, they stood on their own. It's not that they didn't cooperate, because the, the, the tradition on the frontier is that you do cooperate, you help each other, but it was this doing things on doing things yourself and being self-reliant. And I think that you have to plug into that. And well, he's clearly trying, but the idea of the gospel of wealth, that isn't really what the goal is. It's not to make a lot of money. It's to be responsible, to take care of your family, take care of your community. And in that sense, I think Obama's doing a much better job. But I, I think any American candidate for president has to in some way connect with this core feeling about what it is that makes America different from other countries. This just drives Europeans crazy. They're always talking about freedom and liberty. They think, don't we Swedes have liberty? Don't the British have these traditions? But we think that in some way we uniquely hold them. And that's what I think Canada has to touch base with. The question's over here. Yes. Yeah. One of the uh, stories that political figures uh, often try to wrap themselves in is the story of the warrior. And I'm wondering um, uh, what the panelists' uh, individual perspectives on uh, why that particular story seems not to be part of Obama's portfolio. Should I start with it? Um, it, I think his handling of the killing of Osama bin Laden is really the case study for your question. And what I uh, 
I think he's walking a line very well. By the way, I don't think it's him strategizing or planning a story. I think it's just the facts of the case. He both felt the importance of decisive action and was anguished to find himself um, a warrior and a warrior king at this moment. It was the necessary historical, there was such a thing as a necessary historical circumstance. Not everything is a is something you cook up in the policy planning rooms or in the political back rooms. Sometimes you're responding to events. He inherited a situation in which it made a whole lot of sense to blow this guy up. And he knew that you, you, you don't do that uh, in a, you do that because, because you must, and he set about it decisively. But there's every sign that he is a reluctant warrior. And one of the things to say about the American tradition is often misunderstood. We're not really patents on the whole. We're much more, you know, relishing, uh, relishing our role as, as, as warriors. We're much, the, the core story here, the governing story here is the kind of thing that Norman, um, you know, Corwin wrote at the end of World War II, which is that, that the, the, the tyrants were defeated by the kid who works in the gas station and the kid who sold you milk and the, the you know, the people who were not by profession and tradition chillers, uh, you know, with blood dripping from, they are ordinary people with families and kids and a grandma they're crazy about who found it necessary to go win and damn it, if that's the job we're gonna win, we're not going home until it's over over there. So that, and that's one of the things I think I find morally beautiful about the Ameri about American military history. Ask me what I hate about it, it's a much longer speech. But there is something about the, the our reluctance to see ourselves compared to Prussians or even the British, who as uh, Lee said, uh, talk like ladies and kill like tigers. Um, we have a tradition of, uh, you know, of well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna wash my hands and put the wrench away and put the kids to bed, and I'll be over there in a few minutes and we'll kick ass. That that kind of, I am a citizen first and a warrior reluctantly, but don't get me mad. I like like Very your beautiful. choice uh, and, and no, not at all. I think what's interesting about the warrior tradition is that it is there, and we know it from Harrison and Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and so what it does if you're successful in a war is it gives you this attention, or Jackson in New Orleans, uh, that you otherwise wouldn't have, and that was extremely important before you have widespread media that carried stories, because this was a story that you heard about, it was so important. But what is fascinating to me is how critical World War II was in celebrating the veteran. I, it was really interesting that I don't think, at least in California, you could have anyone running for Congress who had not been a veteran of World War II in the 1950s and 60s. And this is really what the, uh, the tradition that had to end sometime because we didn't have that many wars and we have it ending with Clinton. And he takes on this issue of trying to get out of the war and he succeeds and therefore you can win the presidency without being a warrior. Uh, so I, I don't think it's always the same in American history. I think it's been very important in the years after World War II and it's had a long shadow. But I think we're past that now and we've got candidates who aren't veterans. Uh, Romney isn't, you know, Obama isn't, Clinton wasn't, but Gore, Gore was a chaplain. What? George W. Yes, right, right, right. George, yes. George, you want to comment on the warrior? Well, I largely agree with what, what has been said. Um, the thing that uh, that came up with Osama bin Laden actually was not unique in Obama, what Obama was saying. From the beginning, he was talking about veterans, uh, and Michelle and uh, Jill Biden, uh, you know, went out there working with veterans' families. From the beginning, Obama went to, uh, you know, the Veterans Administration hospitals and said, "Hey, something's wrong here. Fix it." You know, he, uh, he so he when he was running for office, he talked about the ordinary men who were fighting over there and getting killed. Uh, he was empathizing with the, the ordinary citizen warrior who was not in, 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 in a warrior in essence, but who was basically a family person. And the coffins. Yes. In, in a moment, we're going to uh, have the pleasure at a reception of uh, grabbing all these people and asking all the questions you didn't have a chance to. We have time for just two more questions. Yes, over there. Uh, yes, well, my uh, 
question is directed primarily at Dr. Appleby, and um, I was wondering what your perspective was with uh, the tradition of women in politics, because uh, one thing that uh, really made an impact on me is that I feel that finally Obama said uh, regarding reproduct women's reproductive rights is that the main problem with the policies that are being passed is that they're being passed by men. And I mean, not only non-doctors, but also men. So um, women's participation has evolved from just being able to participate in the political process to um, equality in the workplace, and now it's around reproductive rights. So what is your comment on that? Well, I think as empathy, be if it becomes more important in American society, there is a sense that there are really serious social problems that are going to require empathetic policy and then I think women are going to be more important. But I think women have now have a difficult time fitting into the American political myths. It, they're, you know, the, the myth is that they're the, the helper, they're the person that's behind the man. And it's going to take, uh, you know, I'm not answering this in terms of policies, but I'm just talking about the understanding of what the political leadership is. I think it's going to take time to have new stories about women, and I think it's going to have a lot to do with the kind of issues and whether or not we address these issues where we see women who do so much better job, not only in, with empathy, but in communicating with one another. Um, <clears throat> and if this happens, if our policy goes in these directions and we address these problems, then I think there will be a bigger, bigger scope for women, and then we'll have stories about America connecting what women are especially good at and with what Americans understand about their traditions. George, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I think one of the, there are several things important here. First, uh, Michelle Obama's talk about what Obama was like as a family person is very important in this. You know, where he's there with his family at night, raising his daughters, uh, and so on. But in addition to that, the thing I mentioned about Hillary Clinton before, and the lesson she learned uh, in the 2008 nomination race, is that it's important that women in politics not be imitation men. Right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, she's good. Right in the middle, our last question. Did you have one? Yes. So I just wanted to know what roles do uh, the vice presidents play in the political narrative in terms of Biden and Ryan and how they contribute? I'm a, you know, is it, this is a surprise that you someone who's a Democrat, but I'm kind of disappointed in the Ryan uh, performance. Because I thought the whole point was that they, during this day, were, were naming him because he had more sort of intellectual substance to his conservatism. He actually had an ideology, a plan, he had, he was wonky on issues. I mean, aside from, you know, being a child of man, he had something to bring to the table. The moment he got named, they told him, now, now be good, shut up, don't say that stuff that we just, Hire you for, and uh, it shows you that the role of being vice president and vice presidential candidate completely obliterates what your, the personal qualities you bring to it, and that's sort of the, the that's sort of the whole story. Even if you're Paul, you don't get to be Paul Ryan. I'm not. I wouldn't be uh, too excited about Paul Ryan being Paul Ryan, but to get name the guy vice president, let him do his thing. Instead, he's asked to talk about uh, you know his, his jogging or whatever. His six pack. His six pack. So, unfortunately. So, uh, we talked uh, a lot about politics. We've connected it to, to history and literature and popular culture just to uh, indicate what a rich area narrative and story is. Uh, look at some of the examples that we did not talk about tonight. Uh, lawyers who, when they talk to a jury, are making up a story that assembles all the things that the jury has heard into a narrative. Religions telling stories to their uh, adherents or potential uh, adherents. Uh, marketers and advertisers who, in 30 seconds, are telling their mini movies, their aspirational stories. Uh, an architect who builds a building. Architects talk about buildings as having narratives as, as we experience them. Maybe scientists are storytellers in some way, too. So lots of possibilities uh, to talk about outside and, and subsequently. Of course, the, all of you will be telling a story about... Uh, no. 
all of you <laughs> will be telling a story about how tonight went. And so I would ask you, please, when you tell the story, be conscious of what kind of storyteller you are. Please join me in thanking our terrific panel.